everything is okay. It's sounding like a dream. Thank you, game biologist. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, friends. Happy to be back here again for my weekly board game design stream. Hope you all are excited for today's show. Uh, we got a fun and exciting suggestion on the Twitters, so I'm excited to brainstorm about that and possibly play around with some other things that I'm working on as well. It's going to be a fun stream today. And we're live. Bam. Hello, Senior Bob. Welcome back to the show. I'm excited. Hope you're excited too. It's fun. It's a good day. Played some games today. Got my butt kicked at many games. Got my butt kicked at Root. Uh, I was playing the birds for the first time and it's a very interesting style of gameplay all about Engine building, probably the best way that I describe it. P putting your cards, looking ahead many turns to see exactly how everything's going to play out. Uh, definitely a little tricky and strategic, uh, but it's fun. And then quicks. Uh, I love quicks, but I really think there's something about my attention or focus because I just miss some of those rolls. And Javion doesn't tell me, of course. You know, it's like, you just missed the blue too. You totally had that. You could have locked that down. Oh, why? Yeah, it's tough. Noticing things is hard. So yeah, for today's challenge, we have been issued a challenge on the Twitter sphere, and that is to redesign a game you all might have heard of called Mousetrap. Mousetrap. Senior Bob says, happy subversary. Thank you. I'm not sure what that means. That means you've been sub for a month, I think? I need to get some plugins installed here so I can see more of y'all's data. Happy subversary, yay. Ah, my pen. See so a mouse trap. I'm just going to assume some people may not have heard of or seen the game because it's always great to give a little background when you're going to be working on something. Ah, oh, Mousetrap. I've been thinking back on the kinds of board games that I played as a kid. I actually didn't grow up playing that many traditional board games, more of a playground game, video game kid. Uh, computer video game kid as opposed to console, but I do have very distinct memories of playing Mousetrap and Monopoly, Scrabble probably, uh, not so much Sorry or Trouble, but Mousetrap was definitely one of the ones that we had and played a few times throughout my childhood. Senior Bob, two months! Yes! Go Senior Bob! <laughs> game all just says should i pull my copy out of my game library and assemble it as we chat i mean that sounds pretty cool that that sounds like a fun thing to do and if you ended up tweeting out some of the pictures and sharing them i could post that in the chat and post it on twitter as well so we have a little visual reference here yeah so mousetrap mousetrap Ooh, okay, that's a mousetrap game. Don't just look up mousetrap on Google, so that is a very different thing. <laughs> mousetrap is, I, I would say, quite a, an adventurous concept for a game, because the idea is that you and the people you're competing against would create this Rube Goldberg machine a bunch of dials, levers, rolling balls, and would all come together to eventually trap a mouse into this little cage that would fall down on the mice. So definitely, first of all, you're assembling a physical structure, so you have to get that right. 
Uh, and then the structure has to work one time through. If anything, if the ball rolls off the edge, if the diver doesn't go into the tank, all these different things. Machine doesn't work, the mice don't get trapped, and yeah, the person, you get to the end of the track, you win or lose, basically a roll and move game. And we're talking a little bit about this on Twitter and it sparked a memory for me there were mousetrap was one of the first games I ever played and really thought and this was a, was a very young child too I was very precocious I specifically thought playing the game that I, I was frustrated about what the game was promising and what the game was offering I think what the game really wants to promise is say hey when you're making a Rube Goldberg machine, it's through you're seeing videos of these things online or, you know, like a Domino's track or something, there's a possibility that the machine you've created is going to fail. Uh, and that's where the tension comes from, right? If the machine works every single time, you just know the mouse is going to get trapped. It's not a iffy, maybe it will, maybe it won't. It's just the outcome is 100% determined. And that's not very fun or exciting. But the thing is, you spend the whole game, the tension building up of you're making the contraption, which is fun. Let me see. <laughs> I'm like thinking back on this. Like, I don't remember. I think you land on the spaces and then you add pieces to the game as it goes. Hmm. Okay, so you can maneuver opponents onto the trap space. Over the course of the game, players at first cooperate to build a Rube Goldberg mouse trap. Once the trap has been built, players turn against each other, attempting to trap a opponent's mouse-shaped game piece. I actually forget what the end condition of this is if you're just trying to get to the end of the track and also being very small children I'm not sure we, I'm 100% sure that we were playing this game correctly but we can break this down piece by piece and see exactly what it is what is the experience that this game is offering uh, what is the expectation that this game is setting does it fulfill the expectation with and for thinking about possible redesigns for the game how can we keep the spirit of the game and make sure that we're fulfilling the expectations that the game is setting up? So, first off, from an expectations perspective, you want to see the trap fall, right? There, there's the tension of, you know, sometimes it falls, sometimes it doesn't, but really the release of having the machine work and have everything that you've built together come together and do the thing that it's supposed to do without, ha without ever having that part of the experience, it's not, it doesn't really get to what it's trying to achieve. Feel if, if I never see the trap fall down on top of the mice, I don't feel 100% satisfied. And again, what's interesting about doing this, doing a show about this, and discussing it and talking about it is sometimes you figure out that some people have different expectations than you, and maybe what you assumed was the general expectation isn't the way that other people feel about a game. So for example, Someone else might look at the game of Mousetrap and think, what I really want is to build the machine. Doesn't matter if it works or not, I just want to put all the pieces together like Legos. The what happens after the assembly is complete, not really a big deal to me. But for me in particular, uh, I'll just write down a couple of expectations and start from there. Um, Build a machine together. 
uh, have the machine execute its stated function. This is actually, this might actually be two parts. Each segment of the machine works the trap falls, final segment. Because there is also a rising tension, right? As you watch each piece, because each piece takes a little bit of time to complete. Uh, even if the final outcome isn't that the trap falls down, the more pieces that successfully work, the, the more exciting the machine is. I actually found a video here where you can see the thing. If it's been... Oh, that is actually pretty satisfying. It's been a while. Since you've seen the whole thing come together, you can watch it here. <laughs> Zinfed says, always wanted the second sections of the device to be modular. Didn't want the same thing going on every time. Ooh, I like that. Hmm. I'm going to put this in expectations since we're talking about redesigning, redeveloping, playing around with this game idea. Uh, expectations based on, just say, looking at the game. I'm going to put this idea of modularity into the list because that's something you might look at it, say, expectations, say, expectations and desires. So what do we want looking at the box? I think expectations is kind of a baseline of what a game should achieve. If it doesn't meet your expectations, then I think it's really hard for a game to be successful. You know, if it says you're going to have an army go out across the field and defeat your opponent's army, and in reality you're just moving the pieces around, you don't really feel like you've had a battle victory, it doesn't fulfill the expectation that it set forth desires, looking at the box of the game or looking at the components of the game, might say, man, I really wish that it did this particular thing. And I think that's a, a good one. Uh, modular segments and why this is a desire different every time. Replayability. The first, I don't think we really played Mousetrap that many times because the first few times, you know, you're building a machine, you're waiting for it to go off, but once everything does happen, uh, and coming back to the fulfillment of expectations part here, once it happens, especially once you have the trap just not go off a few times, it's kind of a disappointment and a letdown. It's okay to have disappointments and letdowns in games, but you have to consider how that contributes to the gameplay as a whole. You need to balance out the letdown with like positives and negatives, and also consider if this is the first time that a particular person plays this game. What is their experience going to be? Because everybody's going to play the game, play a game for the first time once. So you really need to think about that first time play experience. Uh, different every time. Player control. I'm gonna put that in the modular segments as well as in its own header. You get to choose segments. And I think this is what it really comes down to. And even at a young age, this was something, again, as someone who played a lot of video games, that I could see as a design, design flaw for what I specifically was looking for in games, and that's control, choice, making interesting decisions. And this is something for traditional mass market games that wasn't really a thing. We all grew up with a lot of these games where even Monopoly, you know, it's, you might think oh, I can choose 
you, you can choose. <laughs> and the rules are so muddled at this point, and everyone has their own house rules. Probably most of us have never even read the rules of the game. But as I remember it, you could choose in certain situations whether to buy something or not. But for the most part, if you had an opportunity to buy something, you would, because that's how you win the game. So not really a lot of choice. Something like shoots and ladders, literally just rolling dice, trouble, sorry, like you don't get to make any choices in the game, which makes them very accessible for any audience. You know, just do the stuff, roll the dice, move the thing, very easy and straightforward. Don't have to worry about being good or bad at the game. Winning and losing is determined by randomness. Don't necessarily have to feel so bad about winning or losing the game. But it's a passive experience like watching a movie or watching television you know you're interacting in that you're touching the pieces moving the pieces going back and forth but you're not making cho choices you can't build a strategy you can't play one time in one way and then play another time making different decisions i really think the ability to make decisions is a core part of games and most modern games do let you make decisions. I think I do like for mass market games or traditional games how accessible they are where you don't have a lot of complex decisions. I think it's open to a much broader audience. So I'm not saying you have to build a complex mousetrap strategy in order for it to be a fun game and really dig into and think about the the layers of the game. But just some things, you know, branching paths. Am I going to go left or right? What are the different options there? Uh, am I gonna choose to trigger the trap at a certain point? And going into this and thinking about the different ways we might redesign this, um, in a moment, I'm gonna get to expectations and desires, and then some of the things that are that I really like about the game and that are exciting about the game, and looking at ways that we might capture that. Again, this I haven't been hired <laughs> to redesign the game of Mousetrap, and I kind of like it that way because I think that we can push the boundaries and play with this idea, and come up with some really interesting concepts that would probably push the game outside of what an IP holder would want from the game, but they capture that the core of the experience that we want and that we're going for. <laughs> so Bob says, maybe channel the energy for the Fireball Island redesign. I think that's part of, oh, Man, I don't know if I I would have a tough time redesigning a historical game like that that people have a lot of attachment to and a lot of memories about. I, I played the new version of Fireball Island. I never played the original of it, but I think it's... And it's got a similar thing where you... The fireballs, you drop them out, they roll down the paths. It has the kinetic movement action going on like actual physical pieces moving through space over time so, actual physical three dimensional three-dimensional objects moving through space over time. A machine that is set into motion. You have very little control over the outcome. So it's this weird, it's a very fine line to walk over. You have some control, but not total control, which makes it exciting and interesting, right? If you just move your pieces around on the board and have total control, there isn't that excitement of, uh, you know, what's, what's gonna happen. So 
excitement and drama about not knowing the outcome. Find balance between control and lack of control. So then you have some control of how exactly you set the pieces up, maybe. So with Fireball Island, I played it the once. I probably have to play it a few more times to get a full picture of it. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that they stayed pretty close to the original version of the game, which again was a game that came out of that era of not having a lot of choice, not having a lot of control. There, just the way that the cards came out and the players were moving. One of the people I was playing with, because I think when the, whoops, the ball comes down, you hit someone, they lose a card, or there's a little bit of take that-ness to the game, and one person was just happened to be in bad locations. Because the thing about Fireball Island is, if I can knock somebody over with uh, the fireball, I'm going to drop it in such a way that I knock that person over, because that's the whole fun point of the game. But if a certain person, again, there's a lot of luck in it, just happens to be... You know, I know that I want to go after the other person because they're ahead, but I have to go after the person who's in last because I just want to knock someone over. I'm not going to not do the stuff of the game. Uh, so there's a very interesting element there. Um, I'm going to put that under expectations, actually. Expectation is I get to, and I say this over, this is going to, this is, I should write this on a plaque on a wall. This is my motto. So I want to do the stuff of the game. I get to do the stuff of the game. TM. <laughs> it's not actually trademarked. I'm just going to put that there. So I get to set off the trap, whatever it is. And I get to do the stuff of the game. Not that there can't be take that or punishing players of the game. But I get to set off the trap in a way that's strategically beneficial. I'm doing the stuff of the game because it helps me win the game. Not just because I want to do the stuff. Some games just have very fun things in them. Setting off the trap is dramatic and fun and exciting. Fire, firewall and rolling the balls down the hill is fun and exciting but so I'm gonna do that I'm the type of player who like I want to do the fun things of the game flipping over tiles in the game is fun I want to do that if collecting cards is very exciting and I have lots of fun abilities in my hand and I want to do that so I'm a designer who really likes to lean into if I'm going to make a part of my game the funnest part of the game and the kind of thing that people want to do over and over again, just incentivize that and make it good and strategic to be able to do that. Don't say like, oh, you can flip over tiles and discover new resources and then say, well, you only want to do that once in the game because it's very expensive and other people can benefit more from you flipping over the tiles. So having a negative feedback loop where you give someone the option you know it's like offering the candy here's the candy if you eat more than two pieces you're gonna get sick and you're gonna throw up it's like that, that's hard for me as a player to hold back from it's like i just want to eat the candy i don't know so there's some games that are more measured where you have to balance different actions but for a redesign of a game like mousetrap it's about doing fun stuff i don't want to have the option to do stuff multiple times throughout the game. I'm going to build the machine, set it off, build the machine, set it off, and have this, you know, four or five times during the game, just constantly like, oh, I'm building it, tweaking it, pressing the lever. And then, you know, the punishment of that isn't 
necessarily somewhat a player is eliminated or they get sent back to the beginning or whatever it is. Just the, the fun of setting off this physical machine is fun and exciting enough that I don't really need another, like, I'm just going to do that and then have it progress the game in some way. I think what I'm trying to get at here. I don't need any special reason. The mechanic itself is fun and compelling enough. I want to do it multiple times throughout the game because it is so fun and exciting. And I want to be able to share that with other people, uh, to be excited when they set it off, as excited as I am when I set it off. So I don't want it to be too punishing because, you know, some people, if you knock someone out of a game, you feel bad because now they're not playing the game anymore. So you, you get the fun of setting this up and having everything go off. And then it's like, oh, and then I get a little benefit from it. Maybe you get a little benefit, depending on where things go. So making the punishing aspects of it a little bit less. <laughs> Game Alice says, oh boy, my degree of difficulty just went up. Some junior gamer ripped the board in half at some point when I wasn't watching. That should make it a little tougher. Jeez. Okay. Senior Bob says... Maybe keep the falling trap aspect, but it moves around trying to catch mice that are moving around the board. Ooh, I like that. Put it on that little car. Hey, Miles says, thematically, it's a bit weird. You're both the mouse and the mouse trap builder. It feels a bit more darkly philosophical on the nature of life and futility and self-sabotage than most kids' games. I never actually thought, stopped to consider that, but you are absolutely right. It's like, why we're the mouse, but we're trapping each other in this elaborate... I mean, if we can make these elaborate constructions as mice, we're the, the rats of Nim, right? We're highly intelligent mice, but we're using our intelligence instead of furthering our species to sabotage and murder one another, which you know, doesn't seem that far from humans. Brit American, hello. Thank you so much for tuning into the channel. Excited to see you here. Okay. So here's some of the cool things about Mousetrap. Excitement and drama, not knowing the outcome, control and lack of control. The three dimensional objects is definitely something that sets it apart from other games. This Rube Goldberg-esque machine. I don't know of any other game before or since that's done that same sort of a thing, in part because it does <clears throat> just fail. And <clears throat> again, you're this isn't high tolerance engineering. You're not making a machine like a rotary telephone <clears throat> or a bicycle or something that needs to hold up to multiple repetitions, you're making a toy, you're making a game, you're probably trying to manufacture it as cheaply as possible. So the machine, the thing about how ma Mousetrap would work, coming back to my frustrations playing this game as a child, is it would fail in non-fun ways. Uh, so let me just put this in things to improve. Fails in non-interesting, non-fun ways. So we already established that it's okay if the machine fails because you don't want to be 100% certain of what the outcome is going to be. Maybe okay if the machine fails. Mm. Feels in an interesting way, I think, is what I'm trying to get at. See, funny when machine fails in an interesting way. So, interesting, unexpected. 
And again, we're coming back to some of the core elements of good game design of having some control, ex uh, expecting something to happen, uh, surprise and delight. And this is one thing that's very cool about Mousetrap because in board games and more, more modern games where you do have more control, what you're sacrificing is you don't really have the same surprise, delight, foiled expectations. So the, the emotional drama can be very ramped up. The, the feelings that you feel when things happen because you're waiting, you're holding your breath to see exactly what's going to happen in the situation. This is a very difficult emotion for a physical game to capture. And you have some things, Jenga, uh, Catch the Moon, some dexterity games where you, you have the drama a little bit. You don't know if you will be able to place that last brick. You know, the tower is starting to wobble. You feel a similar tension there. But a lot of those games, with their slow build-up and revelation, it's not that surprising. Like, at a certain point, you're like, oh, it's gonna fall this time. You're like, oh, oh it didn't fall. And it just keeps going, keeps going. It's like, okay, it's, it's a little bit different. It's like a slower build, slower burn. Uh, and then kind of a rising action in a very sudden denouement. There's no kind of like build up and release, build up and release, like moments of delight and excitement throughout the game, which I think is a very cool, fun thing to capture in a board game. Delight throughout the game. Yes, yeah, so coming back to how the machine fails, establish that it's okay if the machine fails, fails in interesting ways. You know, maybe you're trying to capture one thing and you end up capturing something else instead. Design ideas. Machine failure. So making the failure of the machine more interesting Capture one thing, capture something else. Uh, you have to, if the machine gets stuck at a certain point, you have to pay resources to get past the block or try again. So there's push your luck of how many resources you have. Yeah, I'm thinking like an optional, like a spinner type mechanism where you still have the machine going off, but you have uncertain outcome. So it's there's always something impactful that happens. So that brings me back to the core frustration of the game and the way in which the machine often fails is when it fails, nothing happens. So this is a improv yes and thing, something that I talk about a lot in relation to role playing games. Certain games like Dungeons and Dragons, when you fail a role, depending on how you're playing the game, how your game master is running the game, it can just mean nothing happens, right? I swing my sword and you know, try to knock it off, its, knock the owlbear off its feet and you miss, you know, and then you just 
okay, you didn't do that thing. You, I got so excited about this thing that I was going to do, and just because of the roll of the dice, you know, it's like, oh, I hit it, and nothing happens. Just this, anytime nothing is happening in a game, it feels like a no in improv, right? I'm putting in effort and energy and excitement and investment into this thing, and I don't get any feedback from it. To be fair, you do get a little bit of the feedback, like you're setting off a machine, you do get the thrill and the fun of seeing it go off, so there's a little bit of something there, but, you know, just kind of this imp impotence of, okay, I attempted to do something and I failed, but didn't fail in an interesting way. You know, I don't have a consequence I have to deal with and make choices with. It's just like, well, I did the thing and nothing happened. And if I'm remembering correctly in Mousetrap, uh, there isn't much of a choice or resolution to the failure. So it's not even like you're building this machine and you're like, oh, if I turn it this way or turn it this way, there might be one way might do one thing, one way might work, one way might not work. It's just you build the machine the way the machine is supposed to be built. And there might be a little of like where exactly you position the diver or whatever, but for the most part, you can't go back and say, okay, the feedback was the failure. How can I process this failure and use it to learn and improve in the future? And again, we got to keep coming back to this idea that this is a family game, this is meant to be a casual game, a mass market game. Not everyone plays games to learn and to improve and to become more strategic. Lots of people just want to roll a dice or press a button, see what happens. It's like a slot machine, right? So talking about working on and improving this game, we don't want to turn it into something it's completely not. But we want to see if we can push some of those levers and play around with it just a little bit to see if we can <laughs> make it a more satisfying experience. Because I say, like, we didn't play it a ton as kids. We would have it, played it a few times, but after a few times of playing the game, you'd look and say, like, I don't know, it's a lot of work. We assemble it and the thing doesn't work. And it doesn't reward you enough just for building and I guess we could have built it and then set off the machine just to see it do the thing. It's not exciting enough that we would just build it for that purpose. You know, it's in kind of a weird middle gray area. Alright, so feedback even when it's failure. When I fail, the machine fails. Cage. Ooh. Little speed lines on there. No. Oh. I think there's a lot of ways to capture this sort of experience. You know, one of my first questions is does it have to be a physical machine? Should it be a physical machine? 
Could you get the same thing through stacking blocks or playing cards? Because again, in one separation between, you look at this and the closest thing I can think of to making a Rube Goldberg machine is the Incredible, Mach the Incredible Machine which is an old video game, there's probably newer versions of it, but where you set up springs and fans and bowling balls and you had to position them in such a way that you would achieve the goal of the level. The thing about a digital version though is it's just so easy to move things and reposition things and play it over again and you can stop it in the middle if it's not doing what you want it to do. Or Lemmings, I guess, is another game in that same vein. So there's the there's a weird barrier to when you're actually when you're setting up a physical thing and it doesn't do what you want it to do it feels very different than when you're setting up a digital thing you can easily just make fast tweaks to it. So something about that fast iteration making it fast enough and easy enough that even if there's a failure you like change things up and swap things around. So you're not blocked by, you don't feel opening up the box of like, well, it's going to take forever to get it to this point. Getting to the fun faster. I think is what I would say. Make it faster and easier to change, to set up change, iterate. You know, it does make me think, all right, we have ideas for machine failure, design ideas for machine construction. Honestly, maybe if it was more set pieces, so instead of having to assemble every individual component, if you just got chunks where this chunk had a thing and it was constructed in such a way that this piece won't fail. If this piece has failed, then there's something broken about the game. That are fail proof. The only potential for failure is in juncture between two set pieces and they're designed in such a way that <laughs> the failures are known and understood. thing about the game as well. It's good to have some, I'm going to draw the, the diver person here, Woo! and the little bucket, and the thing goes up, and the cage is there. Like, failure is fine. It's, it can be stressful. It's sometimes hard to reconcile and come to terms with, but what's harder and frustrating and not fun failure is when you just don't, you're not sure if it's supposed to be like that. And this comes from inaccurate or not enough feedback. Again, what is the game telling me? When the diver goes into the bowl and the trap just doesn't fall, is that did I position the trap incorrectly? Is it broken in some way? Did I position the diver incorrectly? Did I just, did I not do this certain thing with the amount of force? Or is my copy of the game faulty? If you start having to ask yourself all those questions because you don't know, you can't parse from your observations exactly what happened, then it leads to a very muddy 
game experience as opposed to, oh, if I turn this ramp this one way, that the marble goes into this hole. If I turn it this way, the marble goes into this hole. And then something happens in very discreet, clear feedback. Again, this is thing that's much easier to do in digital iterations. You know, you see, you can have control over it as a designer. You know, you can have the trap sitting there and like 25% of the time the trap falls and 75% of the time it doesn't fall. And you can just press the button over and over there to say, okay, I can see that this just falls a certain percentage of the time. Although observing percentages and randomness can be difficult and trickier feedback to process than logically you might think that it is. But there's a lot of ways to offer feedback through a video game to show that you did do the thing, just nothing happened. You know, for, you come up to a door in a video game and you shake the handle, you like try and press on it, you can have a sound. You can have a text pop up and say the door is locked, or just like a jingling sound, or you need a key. There's a lot of little ways through motion, sound, text, tool tips, visuals to say, hey, you did the thing, it didn't do what you think it was gonna do, you have to do something to resolve that. Whereas in this physical contraption, you can just be sitting there saying like, did we put it together wrong? Did we mess something up along the way? The, just the uncertainty isn't fun. Wow, you know, that's so weird. Cause I'd put to, some uncertainty is fun. It's like teetering on the edge and then there's a resolution. Other uncertainty is unfun. I think this thing would be like meta uncertainty. Are we playing the game right? Uh, were the pieces manufactured properly? Are we missing something? American says, maybe it would be fun to have multiple intended outcomes rely on chaos. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, I much prefer, there is an excitement of uncertain outcomes, but when the outcome is something really cool happens or nothing happens, it's not as cool as something really cool is going to happen. I don't know what it is. I think you can still... I think you have equal excitement for those two things. Uh, but then when the one thing happens, I think I'm going to draw the excitement curve here to help me illustrate my point. So it's like event. For example, I'm gonna sneeze. Excuse me. Look into the light. Excuse me. The thing happens, especially since it takes a little bit of time to happen. Uh, so this is excitement, it's building, it's building. And then you have after the event, a sudden spike, right? And then you come down. So before the event horizon, right? Something is happening, something's gonna change, I'm ready for it. 
So in both of them, you have the same rising action for your excitement. Do, 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 do. Event happens. And then just doesn't do the thing. It's kind of like... Bah, bah, bah. And again, that could be the first time you play the game. That could be the every time you play the game with no guarantees that the machine will ever go off, right? You could... I'm pretty sure I've seen the machine go off at least once, so... There's, there's just nothing that, and again, digitally you can ensure this. You can say every 10 times something will happen. You don't have to have pure randomness. But for this, you know, you could play the game 10 times, 20 times. You could press the lever or whatever, it just never happens. It's unlikely, but with the way it's set up, it's set up to sometimes work and sometimes not work. And then that excitement leading up to the event is still the same no matter what happens. Like you're excited, you're waiting. And then nothing happens, and that creates a, a feedback loop for you. It's like, okay, when I do this, nothing happens. And if you do that a few more times, you know, like, oh, I bet nothing's gonna happen. And every time, you have you get less and less excited leading up to it, right? Because you're like, oh, I bet nothing will happen. I bet nothing will happen. Whereas if you have multiple outcomes, and maybe some of them are really good, some of them are really bad. So in this one, say, oh, mouse goes to jail. You know, and that's the thing too, even if something bad happens to you, something happened. So it's still it's still kind of exciting, right? You say like, oh, I go to jail, go to mouse jail. I might not feel great about that. It's like, oh no, I went to mouse jail. And then this one over here, you get a cheese or whatever. Yeah, and just kind of throwing ideas out there. And maybe it's like a little blip of excitement. But it doesn't have that nothing happens crash after it, which is with this kind of purely dealing with the randomness of the variations in the track or the construction and how it was assembled, all these factors that go into it. And as a designer, having so little control over that, really having no control, very little control over this excitement curve is tough. And it's tough to make a consistent gameplay experience. Without more control over the excitement curve and really just the nothing happening and with so much opportunity for nothing to happen that's tough so I think playing around with this trying to hold on to the original feeling but still making it I don't want to say better game necessarily because like plenty of people who enjoyed the original like like Richard Garfield said, you know, he plays a game, if he doesn't like it, he plays it and he understands why the people who like the game enjoy it. And for this sort of game, you know, it's simple enough, you're just following the instructions, easy enough for everything to come together. Like, you don't want to lose a lot of those elements if you want to preserve the gameplay. But having it be a little more consistent, again, not, not consistent like, Oh, you always win or you don't get eliminated like you don't have to make the game consistent and flat and boring i think that's an important thing to emphasize uh, it's easy for consistency to become boring You want to avoid that. Kate Bell says, the kids who play and apparently break my copy mostly get peeved when the device misfires. Yeah, exactly. 
Things aren't aligned well, so the ball doesn't go where it's supposed to. The boot doesn't kick high enough to trigger the next step, etc. Not really player error or randomness. It's poor production with small failure tolerances for the device to work properly. The, thank you, game biologist. I think that's you've said it better than I could have. This is the poor tolerances. So that's and again, part of that is mechanical from a design standpoint. Because again, if the trap just went off every time you wouldn't have that tension and that drama that I think is important to this sort of a mass market game. And I think in designing it, like that's maybe an easy fix if from an engineering perspective, you could just make a machine that goes off more consistently. But I think you also need to have, again, some choice or control or randomness to make sure that it you inject excitement where that excitement of potential failure would occur. Mm -hmm. The mice players can do things to sabotage the machine. Ooh. <laughs> I like that. And again, you don't want to sabotage the machine so that it doesn't work, especially if someone is building a thing and then you're breaking the thing, it's, it's not a fun tension, right? Undoing someone's effort and labor can be a very frustrating experience. So I say, uh, machine construction, can choose to build the machine for different outcomes add different functions or features to it. Okay, I want to try to find some interesting things for the machine to do. There's initially just nothing, right? <laughs> okay, Twitter keeps autocorrecting mouse trap to moose trap. So add that as another potential modification. I really like that. I'm gonna put that put that in my notes. <laughs> And this thing, too, thematically, you know, if we really are going to look into building a game out of this, probably not have it be Mousetrap. We already commented earlier in the show about how the fact the mice are building the trap and they're also existing as the mice or you're the Pied Piper controlling the mice. Thematically, it's a little bit muddled. So playing around with different themes... <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking about a giant, like how big a moose trap would have to be. Uh, and moose are tough too, just keeping them in whatever the trap was, the moose can fight back. And that's another interesting thing to consider. Up until this point in the discussion, we've been talking about how it's important for there to be variable outcomes, but building a machine that works, especially if you know that maybe there's different modules that you can put together, and then seeing the machine do the thing you thought it was going to be, that's a type of fun in and of itself. Like there's definitely a satisfaction there. So maybe the intensity and the drama can come from not variable outcomes of the machine, but putting it together this machine, it does the thing, and then maybe you know, once you get trapped, you can fight your way out of the trap, or there's multiple traps, and you can, yeah, maybe instead of it being modular, one big put together machine, there's different traps that have like little mini machines that go off, and you can choose which one to do. Maybe there isn't a construction element to it, so again, maybe it's pre-made modular items. I'm gonna write all that down, because that was a lot. All right, so we have machine failure. Does it have to fail? And design ideas, modular. Maybe the machine doesn't have variable outcomes. <laughs> it always works. Again, for physical 3D action, maybe that's harder to do and produce. And can you actually 
physically engineer and produce something that always works. You know, they kind of, with again the build quality of that, it's a mass market toy. So they kind of turned a flaw into something mechanical from a game design perspective, right? Well, we can't possibly make this work every time. So we're just gonna make that be part of gameplay. Pretty smart if you think about it. Uh, the variability comes from which modules you string together. Choices about when to trap, where to trap, who to trap, break out of trap. In this case, we're separating out the win condition of the game and just having a cool machine that does fun things. So I think you look at Gizmos, it's probably is a good example of this because you have the box and you have the marbles and you pull a marble and then another one comes out. So you do have that same kinetic, I'm gonna write down that, that term because that's an important part of the movement, kinetic. Uh, has a kinetic machine that always works. This should always work. It's always intended to work. And a lot of the fun just comes from using the machine. All right, module the machine, sticking them all together. Print machines across the play space. Get to choose. Now, one of the things I just keep coming back to is, again, coming from a design and engineering background, it's tough to make things work. You know, I've built uh, little light devices that have movement and light in them. For some of my product design classes in college, I made like a box that was a light and a lamp. And it also had a motor in it that would make a piece hit the side of it. So my intention was for it to feel like a beating heart. Uh, and just making everything work and the programming and the timing. Yeah, physical things and making it keep working and make it work every time. It's a lot of considerations that go into that. So, you know, it's one thing to consider. Uh, machine failure. Does it have to fail? Also, are there other ways we can tap into machine failure and make it interesting. Lean into the fact that it's really hard for this sort of mass manufactured machine, let's say that three times fast, to work every time. Man machine, it's a man machine. <laughs> From, uh, from a product and production standpoint, that's something very important to consider as well. We keep coming back to this concept, and I think it's a very fun, interesting one to play around with. Like, how does failure become fun and interesting? How do we design for consistent failure? For consistent, for how we just how do we design a product to fail consistently enough that we can create an experience within so we can do a thought exercise here, right? Imagine that you had 
mousetrap, exactly like it is, but the trap falls, like, absolutely falls once every three times, right? So there's something mechanized or it's built, again, impossible to engineer that. Digitally, yeah, fine. Physically, almost impossible. At mass production quantities, definitely impossible. You could probably do it with timers and uh, chips and programming motors to go off in a certain way. Uh, you could build a physical calculator to do it, right? So first time you do it, and you're like, oh, I don't know if it's going to fail. It doesn't fail. Second time, I don't know if it's going to fail. Third time, you know it's going to fail because uh, it's programmed in such a way. You can play around with algorithms to say, for example, if you're doing a software program, you programmed Mousetrap digitally, you might have a percentages thing. Say, okay, every time it fails in a game, increase the likelihood that it's going to succeed by 10%. And then you get this, it's close enough to randomness that it's imperceptible to the human brain to assess those percentages, but it always happens, you know? Just making that certainty in there and that's you know how our brains work as humans we're just like you know that some it has to happen one of these times and again probabilistically you play mousetrap enough times it's gonna happen but it also might never happen yeah you know, it's just the way that randomness works somebody's gonna play that game a thousand times and it's never gonna come down you know and that's something you have to think about as a designer Moose trap. Email just says mechanical failure of the device doesn't feel like an uncertainty issue. It feels like a failure of the game to provide feedback to the player when they make their move. And that's an important aspect of it as well. We can think about it from a logical perspective and say, well, you know, it's supposed to go off so many times from a mature perspective. But again, if you're playing the game as a casual player, you do the stuff and again you don't get the feed the feedback that you want is the trap falls i do the thing and the fat trap falls that's my expectation of the feedback and denying someone that experience doesn't feel great <laughs> game says team co-op one team is the mice the other is the trap builders both teams have affirmative actions to take to achieve their ultimate end goal build the trap and catch the mice versus build the cheese stealer and steal the cheese oh i like that team-based <laughs> trap versus untrap. I know that's not exactly what you said, but I, it made me think of that and I kind of like that. Yeah, we have a trapping and cheese stealing or trapping versus escaping the trap. Senior Bob, so assuming the machine functionally works, maybe design it so the marble can go down different paths, one of which is trigger the trap. The other marble paths could provide a bonus, open the mouse jail, etc. Yeah. And I like playing around with probabilities in this way, like I had mentioned, uh, <laughs> positive failures. Doesn't do... 100% what you want. Maybe it does exactly what you don't want. Release all the mice from jail. But it does something. You know, just do something. Do the thing that's the frustration. You press the lever, it's like, oh my boy, this every single time. Like, I just want you to do a thing. I don't care what you do, just do something. Zinfad says, perhaps the board has a variety of levers. Ooh, I like that. Each lever activates one part of the machine. But they have to be activated 
In order, over the game, you learn which levers activate which parts of the machine. Ooh, I like that. And we were talking about throwing around a couple of different ideas here. I like this idea of, again, this is not about failure. Building a game like Mousetrap is one particular direction to go for this design where the things work. You know, it's not about will it work, will it function, or, will it won't, or won't it function, but figuring out the processes and having these little dials and levers. Man, it makes me think of, what is that marble tower? Marble drop? Oh. Hmm, marble drop is a digital game. The marble run, marble genius? Marble run. Oh, wow, that looks so cool. Oh my gosh. All right, I'm gonna post this because this is super cool and fun. And I think what I like about the marble run thing is it captures a lot of the kineticness and feel of it, but without the failure aspect. So I think it's a good design inspiration to look at. And I think the marbles sometimes have variable paths. But I like the levers in a track switching sort of way. So maybe you're building a marble run. Uh, then you have to, you have to test the runs and set the switches to make it reach the correct destination. I don't know if the marble runs actually have levers in them, but and thinking very high level and conceptually about this. Draw a very abstract thing. Yeah, I have four tracks and represent because again, the I like the marble drop has the kinetic, the motion action to it, which I think is an important part of this. Dun. Junctions with lever switches. You don't know which one goes which way. So it's like a button press as opposed to an actual lever where you can see what your actions are. So we have a few different ideas here. We have a few different potential directions to take our redesign. Kinectic. <laughs> Kinetic. Yeah, there we go. I like Kinectic though. It connects. So it's easy to look at it and say, from a conceptual perspective and say, well, you know, make the machines work better. You know, take out the machine aspect of it. I mean, for, you know, the, the levers switching direction things, you could have a card based version of a machine, you know, and that just says, or programming electricity, you know, say water, for example. Say 
the water is going here. You lay out different pipes, like cards or tiles with pipes. And then maybe something has a switch or a juncture where you can replace a card. Or add another card, it's like a dead end. So you can make games that approximate a kinetic movement theme without having 3D physical items move. Obviously you don't have to worry about the engineering that way. And you don't get that kinetic feel. It's a lot easier to prototype, playtest, manufacture, and produce. And the question is, does that capture the feel? You could even say, build the mousetrap out of cards. It just doesn't have to physically work. It's more about assembling the pieces and someone can remove a piece of it or build a different thing, you know, maybe a mouse would run. You know, maybe you're making tunnels instead of water. You're assembling tunnels. You could have a juncture card. Different junctures. Bends, different weird angles making a path for mice. And you can even have, make a little bit of movement aspect to it. You can have your, <laughs> your mouse cube, mouse meeple. Running around. Uh, it could be team based. Some want escape, some want trap. So, multiplayer tunnel building system. Trying to lure mice into dead end for trapping. Other half trying to release the mice to freedom. The reason I like discussing about something that on the surface of it feels very different from the existing mousetrap game is how can we look at the theme, first of all, you know, have something about escaping versus trapping and how we can play around with that. And then is there a way that we can capture mechanical mood, drama, fun, excitement wise, can we capture the fun of what the game is trying to do without having to manufacture this thing and worrying about stuff like tolerances, about failure of the machine. I'm not saying that's the right design direction to go into, but I like exploring possible ways that we can capture a similar experience in very different gameplay environments. Alright. So No physical 3D machine. Three D machine that doesn't fail. Physical three D machine that fails in interesting ways. <laughs> Mouse dungeon. I like it. <laughs> A 
on Mouse Dungeon. Yeah, it's a good name for that. Not Mouse Trap. It's Mouse Dungeon. That is kind of like what I'm thinking about. Ice in the Dungeon. Speaking of cool marble runs with multiple forking paths. Ooh, is this? Oh, yeah, I love these things. Yeah, it's kind of perpetual motion machines. I know they're usually not perpetual motion, but sometimes they're touted as that. I like that. So yeah, bringing it all back together for me as a game designer, the skills I have, the abilities I have, making something that captures the idea of the game with cards or pieces is definitely a compelling design exercise. And then you can start to think, okay, so we have, these are cards or tiles. And we have a little bit of simulated kinetic action with moving a piece along a track manually. Kinetic, kinetic action by moving a token along the path. Manu manually. Physical 3D space, but not a machine. So taking this idea of tracks and paths and moving around maybe you're still moving the token manually but you have levels directions choices so i'm thinking like a three-dimensional blocks uh you're building your path and then maybe there's like a stair situation, uh, like a slide, like a little track, and like the little bridge thing. <laughs> Thinking now of that, uh, the car with the tracks, so the old fashioned toy where you can have little grooves you push the train around in. Have a track made of three dimensional components, like one of those train tracks. Grooves. What is that even called? I see it at Ikea. Block train. Ooh, yes. Uh, wooden train set. Hmm. Magnetic trains and railways. <laughs> I'm going to post a link to this just because I feel like block train thing once you see it you'll totally know what it is but just the way that i'm describing it is a little tricky right. block trains you move your piece in 3d space uh maybe it could be a train or a car or marble so there is some uncontrolled kinetic motion really trying to dig into what it is that makes this game interesting and exciting and different than other games and the pieces of it that you would want to have in a redesign. So just this idea that you let go of it and it does its own thing is a core part, uh, very interesting, makes it very different than a lot of the stuff that's out there. So 
So having cars where you move something around two-dimensionally, a two-dimensional track, having something where you move stuff around three-dimensionally, splitting trails or tracks and again might have still have the trapping theme to it trapping escape theme <laughs> going off the dungeon idea maybe a marble run could result in a gate opening inside the dungeon Ooh, I like that or a trap door ah. And then going to the actual physical 3D machine, what kind of components or modules could you have that wouldn't fail? It's like a design challenge, an engineering challenge. It's just very simple machines. <laughs> Very simple machines. Rolling a marble down a ramp. Maybe you measure how far it goes. around with very simple machines simplifying the elements so you still get that fun kinetic move God, I keep doing kinetic I think I'm thinking about the kinetics. <laughs> kinetic movement Rolling marbles. Like a lever, leveraging things. And this harkens back to the prototype I had made a while back about having this teeter-totter and having the marbles inside it and balancing it and mechanizing that in an interesting way, which I like. Teeter-totter. Uh, lever balance. Balancing different weights. That you unbalance. Tip the scales. Sliding boxes. Friction. Force. Senior Bob says, something involving a pendulum. Yeah. Build a pachinko machine fueled by cheese and mice. <laughs> I like that. Pachinko machine is good because it is, if you build it correctly, it is purely randomness. It's hard to build it 100% balanced and random, but it still feels nicely random. This is the part that I kind of get a little bit stuck on. 
is, you know, again, it's more of a physical engineering challenge for what can I physically build? It's kind of a toy question, right? What can I make that will be fun and interesting and reliable to interact with? And you know, a lot of toys really aren't that reliable. They don't have to be. You know, a water gun that only holds pressure for a few times, or you know, the doll that you put water into it and then it leaks into its diaper. Anything with moving parts to it that is meant to be heavily interacted with, there's kind of two modes for that. You can make it inexpensive to produce and unreliable or make it expensive and reliable, but then you don't have interesting failures with it. Reliable and boring, right? That's the core question we're asking here. How do we make something physical fail reliably, unreliably, in interesting ways? Reliably unreliable. Interesting and yet moderate, moderately consistent ways. That has a design challenge. And that's something that you can really explore through play, messing around with simple machines, levers, marbles, rolling balls. Uh, ties a little bit back to the game we had talked about a month or so ago with the cars, piling blocks on top of the cars, smashing the cars into each other, having this kineticness and interesting physical failures. Uh, one other thing we can look into or think about is programming a physical machine and we had talked a little bit about this with the for example the levers so you can program a physical machine even without electronics in a way a similar way that you can program a computer and it takes up more space uh, and you do much simpler programs or calculations with these kinds of things, but imagine, uh, again, like with a pachinko machine or with this marble drop, for example, you have, think about the old school marble drop where you have the actual wooden blocks where the things roll through. So you have one, a block, for example, that a marble can travel through, and it's just a straight path, right? I'm trying to draw that with the dotted lines. And you have another path, uh, another path, another block, where it has one hole and then multiple egresses. Then again, this is sloped, kind of a curve. And then you have a couple of different options. future directions it can go, but you can also control this, right, by say it has two exit slots, 
and it's sitting on top of three different potential directions for the model to go into. Uh, rotate it to change the future. So right now, talking, looking at this physical setup, we had to do a lot of work to get a physical setup, but there's three potential states. A and B have a 50% chance and then C has a 0% chance because there's no hole facing in that direction. And that's a switch. It's on and off. It's a 0 or a 1, right? It's basically programming. And through having these states that you have control over, if you, again, can make a machine that works the way it's supposed to, but you can introduce some level of randomness by having a, an A, B state to a thing and then having pieces that you can manipulate in very simple ways to turn on or off certain outcomes. And again, I don't know, like the marble drop, oh, <sighs> is a fun and interesting direction. It does capture that kinetic action. You just get one of these marble sets, right? And play around with, how do I, mm, how do I gameify, gameify? How do I add game-like elements to this physical device so we can keep the kinetic nature of it, keep the choice construction element of it and then add in some variability so the outcomes aren't 100% known. We'll draw segments that can rotate, changing the outcomes. Build the machine and change the machine over time. Uh, or another option for something like this is like with Fireball Island where it's all pre-constructed. So you don't have the building element and you don't have potential failure for how it's assembled. You can only uh, interact with a machine that's already been construction. are set up in a way that they can't fail. <laughs> uh, limit the user error of construction. Users can rotate or swap pieces, uh, plug passageways, again, turn things on and off. They can't assemble and disassemble. This is a mechanic, again, that you could simulate with cards or tiles or tokens and we're coming up against a very interesting concept of the original Mousetrap game, which is, again, keep coming back to, a lot of the fun and the interest and the excitement comes from the fact that it's actual physical pieces and you set it up, you build a thing, and you get executed, you gotta watch the pieces move without you touching or controlling them. And I think that's something 
in a re-implementation or redesign that you would still want to capture. I think without that, you're losing a lot of the game. Uh, watching your program execute. Physically, because I'm thinking now, even with a card-based version, you can have movement and variability that you don't have control over. So say that you again, are building this, even prototyping with cards, you might eventually go to a physical construction. But I think it's the kind of design that would be interesting to prototype in a simple form first. Because I think if the... I don't think just adding a connect kinetic element to it will make it fun. I think it can bump up the fun, and translating this into that physical factor can be really interesting. But... I think if it's not fun in the simplified version, it won't be fun in other versions. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how these cards will actually physically look, but say, for example, you have something like this, and you're building out your track. You have some straight pieces and some branching pieces. And you have your token that's here. So you can still simulate the how far something will go. You know, you can still add a little bit of randomness to this. Um, by flip dice roll, just traditional methods of random dice, flip cards. All right, so I have cards numbered one through three. Flip one over, it's a two card. And that just moves, means it'll move two spaces. And when it comes to a branch, there's A or B. Uh, flip a coin, again, whatever to the A side, coin flip. All right, so, all right, so goes two spaces, it's gonna go through the A here, one, and there's no choice here, so it moves two. So there's ways that you can simulate the physical randomness, again, without having to worry about the physical failure. Going back and forth between these two things. And since we're coming close towards the end of the stream, I want to tie it up a little bit. I hope this conversation has been helpful and useful and interesting to you. But looking at a re-implementation and a design like this, or even if you're looking at making a physical machine versus making a representation of a physical machine, the different things you have to consider. The fun and the physicality of watching a dice roll watching a diver flip into a cup or watching a mouse trap fall down, there's something very visceral about physicality. That we don't get physicality. Kinetic physicality, yeah, I spelled right at that time. That we don't get in a lot of board games. The, the, the toy-like factor. Part of the reason that Fireball Island was such a success and Mousetrap is still a recognizable game because they do capture that excitement of things moving and changing and watching in real time. Yes, and we see in video games all the time, but when it comes to seeing them in real physical life, it's something, it's an experience we don't have that much 
And most, especially nowadays, with a lot of us living increasingly digital lives, we can watch a car or a ball roll around, move around in digital space. But having that kinetic experience in physical space is a little rare. So it's definitely something to capturing those. I'm excited and interested to see more games do that. We have dexterity stacking games is a space where a lot of people feel more comfortable experimenting. But I think that there's other forms of physical board game play that are very much worth exploring. I think from a design perspective, coming at it from this form of prototyping and starting off from uh, paper prototyping, you know, doing it in a very easy, fast iteration way, then that can lead us to showing exactly what kind of physical machine before we get to the physical and should it be this rolling train, should it be marble, should it be something else entirely. I think it's so worth playing around with those pieces. So dual design tracks, I would say. Figuring out the mechanics of what the actual choices of the game will be, and then playing around with toys, simple machines, seeing how you might manifest that in a three-dimensional space. Uh, I think it's very cool. So it's a cool design challenge, design question. Something I'm interested in exploring, and I hope you're interested in exploring as well, because I think there's a lot of design space there. There's a lot of area to explore that hasn't been explored nearly enough, in my opinion. And again, some of that comes down to cost, production, engineering expertise. Is this even something that we can physically produce at this price? There's a lot of questions there. It's definitely not the simplest or easiest type of game to design and prototype, but there's a rich soil there to be explored. And I think there can be a lot of benefit for working on something that not a lot of other people are trying to do. <laughs> Senior Bob saying, Hot Wheels, car, speed ramps always had interesting failures. I never got to play around too much with those. I always assumed that these amazing videos where, you know, it's like speeding around, speeding around the track and then it launches off and hits another ramp and does these cool things. I always assumed that it just didn't work anything at all like that. We did have, as kids, we had a nice like high end race car track at one point. I don't know what happened to that, but the cars would go very fast. It was fun play around with. This one, this one of the good final thoughts. Uh, Hot Wheels, electric car tracks. Is there something there? Board game. I'm thinking about all the different ways that this could work. I'm thinking having a track or a marble tunnel, something along those lines. I'm gravitating towards that because I feel, again, a little less likely to have unexpected, uh, a little less likely to have unexpected failures. Train tracks. called on rails for a reason. And again, this is something that's pretty easy, trivial even to implement in a digital setting. Transforming it into that 3D physical thing that's very satisfying to interact with and play with the toy lens or the toy aspect. Oh, 
fun to physically manipulate. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Senior Robin says, I'm seeing this as a deck building game. Oh my gosh, you know me too well. Maybe. Maybe you can have a deck building element to it. There's nothing to say it can't, right? Deck building. Deck building. So yeah, I'm gonna wrap up here in a couple of minutes. I did want to leave with one final thought. And that is, we talked about production challenges, assembly challenges, manufacturing challenges. There's also the part of something like this cost, you know? Something like this has a lot of components and a lot of bits. And the question is for the target audience, who is gonna be most excited about this and it really has to be worth pulling out all of the pieces and assembling all of the pieces for any sort of a game, you know, capital K Kickstarter board game with all these pieces and all the minis and all the tokens really has to fulfill what the people want from it in order for it to be suitable for your target audience. You know, we're talking about marble tracks and things moving and sliding together, how much setup and construction is there before you actually get to the fun? The thing about Mousetrap as a game is you are setting it up as you go along and memory serves me the setting up aspect to it was kind of interesting and fun. So they made setup part of the game, which is genius, right? I think for a game like this to work, you would have to have that be a thing. And you know, how many times do you click the marble track together, or the car track, or set up the ramp or the lever, or whatever it ends up being, how many times do you do that and have it still be fun and satisfying? You know, the dexterity games that are successful, Jenga, it comes with a thing. You set up the tower, very straightforward, very simple. Catch the moon, you're balancing the ladders, the actual act of balancing every one, animal upon animal, balancing the animals, one or two, the interesting shapes is what keeps it interesting and fresh. And then it's a short enough, fast enough game that, you know, you do it five minutes, you got the fun you wanted out of it, that's fine. You can do it over and over, bring some people over, take a break, do it again. So I think that's the last core design piece to that. Keeping, setup, building, and especially putting the game away. <laughs> I mean, it's funny and almost a little bit frustrating and sad to think about even a game like Jenga, you know, pouring it out, having to put all those pieces back in the box, uh, or Pinnacle, or anything that had Blockus, even having to sort all the individual components. It's not even that big of a deal, really. Just for me, even nowadays, just getting to the point of being so lazy, almost, to just look at that. You look at the box, and as uh, a parent or a caregiver, for example, think about are those pieces going to get lost? How frust or how hard is it going to be to put back in the box? You know, are my kids going to do it themselves or am I going to have to be involved? You know, it's all interesting considerations when you're thinking about making a physical game. And we talked about modular earlier. But maybe it isn't all these little bits you have to put together. You know, maybe it's just big chunks of stuff like three or four different segments. And we're only going to use three segments in the game, but they're easy to unpack. And we were talking about Mousetrap specifically on Twitter. It was, well, I think it was Anne-Marie? On Twitter? Uh, someone was talking about how they couldn't get that game. It was their dream game, but 
they had siblings who would instantly lose the pieces. And there are so many small pieces that go into that game. Uh, the game, it was a successful game, even with losable pieces. Just gonna make a note here. Direction. <laughs> it's funny, this is the type of game too that I've talked about multiple times with the design. It's like, what if the whole game is setting up the game and by the time the game is done you've set it up but part of the mechanics of the game is setting it up because it is a thing with a lot of these high setup games a lot of games take a lot of more modern games i've seen take as much time to set up almost as much time to set up as you actually spend playing the game is that a satisfying experience so making setup part of the game in a way that's fun and interesting for people and not a slog. <laughs> Girls came shelf. Ah, just saw that you were on. Thanks for joining us. We're about to wrap up in just a little bit, but really appreciate having you all on here. I believe you are participants. Oh my gosh, there's a tweet. <laughs> P.S. For anyone wanting to chat mousetrap, swing over to us. Yes. Thank you, Game Knowledge, about tweeting about that. We're just about to get wrapped up here, but you were part of the inspiration for this game design challenge, redesigning mousetrap. Uh, I think we came up with some interesting stuff here. And just so everyone knows, the highlight whole stream is always saved on Twitch, so you can go back and watch that and see the comments that happened during the stream. You can also watch it on YouTube if you prefer that as well. <laughs> Senor Watashi, hello. Man, I think do I need to start my stream later? It's just just now as we're about to get wrapped up is when everyone is hopping on and joining us. Or maybe I just need to do tweets as we're streaming as well. Thanks everyone so much for joining us. If you're just joining us now, you can also watch the replays on Twitch and YouTube. Lots of ways to hop in on this we stream every week, 4 p.m. PST, every Tuesday, talking about a board game design stream. Our topic today was mousetrap. We have lots of fun pictures and art of the different directions we're thinking about taking this game. Uh, every week we do something a little bit different talk about some of the concepts, ideas, redesigning things, working on some of the board game designs that I'm working on, coming up with ideas, and really discussing and unpacking what it means to make games and what makes games fun. For Mousetrap, for example, we got into a lot of, is it the 3D motion, the kinetic aspect of building a thing that makes it fun, or is it something that could be simulated in a much easier to produce form factor? Could it could Mousetrap be a card game or a tile laying game where you have some randomness of your token moving along the path, but you don't have to worry about the same physical construction aspects? Also, if anyone is inspired by any anything we've chatted about today, feel free to take any of these ideas and run with them. I'm never going to be able to make every game that we come up with on stream. I'm already way backlogged with all the things that I have to work on, and I really just want to see these games become real things. That is my idea, my passion. I want to play test these. This, if someone comes up to me at a con and says like, oh, I made the pumpkin game, or I made that re-implementation of Mousetrap, do you want to try it out? This would be fun. You know, this is, I don't know from this, I'm not sure what this design would look like. It's a very tricky design challenge, and I think that's what makes it exciting and interesting. And I forget who was talking about it a month or so ago on Facebook and Twitter. It might have been... John Gilmore, but someone was mentioning the kinds of games, board games, they want to see more of, and it was stuff like uh, Katamari, you know, stuff like Mousetrap, uh, you know, games like 
Link's Awakening. Things were taking learnings from video games and from toys and taking some of that fun and excitement and just juiciness of video games and playground games and toys and injecting that into board game play. So there's a lot of heavy Euro games, there's a lot of heavily strategic games, a lot of very thinky games, but I think there's a huge unexplored design space around this, you know, physicality, fun, dramatic, high points, low points, fast, accessible, easy to learn, easy to share. I think that's a great design space that I'd love to see explored more. <laughs> Game Mother says, it's my bedtime now. Okay, have fun, have a good night, have a good sleep. Senior Ritashi says, well, we just finished work for the day. By the way, guys from Flat Out told about your new game. Looks very nice. I assume you're talking about Abandon All Artichokes is a game that Game Right just mentioned on their uh, catalog that they released. They're going to be coming out with it very soon. Actually, in the next few days at New York City Toy Fair, it's going to have its trade debut. So you might see some pictures and rumblings from then. I'm not going to have it at PAX East, unfortunately, but within the next month or so, it should hopefully be hitting stores. So I don't want to make any promises, but if you're looking for a fun new deck builder game with adorable art, Van and Artichokes is sweet. You should definitely check that out. Been all artichokes, yes, awesome. Excited to hear that people are talking about that and sharing it. Yeah, so this is gonna be it for me for the day. Hope you all have been enjoying this board game design stream. I'm always open to feedback. If you have any thoughts about the show, definitely type them in here in the chat. You can also always hit me up on Twitter at Emma Larkins. Very excited to hear what people think, they're enjoying it, expectations. We talked at the beginning of the show about board games, how they set up expectations, whether or not they fill those expectations. So I always like to hear if what you got from the show is what you were expecting. Um, interested in the future to play around more with the show, potentially do more physical production of games in addition to just thinking about them, brainstorming them. But yeah, love doing this. I love getting the creative juices from you all. I love the design back and forth. I think we come up with some really exciting things. I'm always so inspired to work on new things based on what we talk about in the show. I gotta just make more stuff. You know, I just gotta sit down, button chair time, get these prototypes produced because I want to play these games. I'm so excited about them. <laughs> it's about Saturday morning stream. I did. I saw your feedback about that. <sighs> I could do... Think about... Tuesdays are great because you usually aren't interrupted by convention travel. Saturdays are a little trickier. Also just get like Saturday morning. Getting up early on a Saturday morning. I could potentially do that. I, I, I saw your feedback. I heard heard your feedback. We appreciate your feedback. Uh, I'm not doing anything on Saturday, so we'll see. I'll, I'll keep it in mind, put it in my calendar, see what we could do, because that could be... Also, depending on time zones, like Saturday morning my time, if I get up at 9 or 10 on a Saturday, it's not going to be morning time for you anymore, but we'll see. We'll, we'll play around with some Saturdays. Might do like once, once a month Saturdays. I've been looking for more stream time, so. We'll see what we can do. We'll put it on the docket and see if we can make that happen. All right. Good night, Senor Watashi. Thanks everyone for joining. Really appreciate having you here. Going to tune off for the night, but thanks so much for joining me. Don't forget, you can follow the channel or even subscribe. If you have Amazon Prime, you get free subscriptions, which is an awesome way to help support the show. Always enjoy having you, chatting with you. 6 a.m. Saturday stream? Oh my gosh, Shane Rob, you do not know me. If you think I'm getting up at 6, 6 a.m., it's not even a real time, okay? I am a night owl, nighttime person that is very early in the morning. 
probably not doable, but I'll see. See what I can do. That's going to be it for now. Tune in next time. Thursdays, we do a board game stream. Don't forget to catch me on Gen Con TV as well. We're doing news shows and also doing some new live role playing, which is super fun. Love being here. Love streaming and hanging out. That's going to be it for tonight. Have a great night. I'll see you around the table. Bye.